Good afternoon. Welcome to the Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Environment and Energy. This afternoon, we are welcoming the Vermont Housing Conservation <coughs> Coalition members. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks for having us all here today. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are excited to talk about the opportunity. Um, we're excited for the opportunity to speak with you all about the importance of natural and working lands in Vermont and the critical role that VHCB, VHCB, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, plays in um, funding this critical work. For the record, I am Lauren Oates, the Director of Government Relations and Policy with the Nature Conservancy, uh, but I am here today as a co-chair of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Coalition. VHCC is a group of about 50 organizations in the state working in your communities and elsewhere throughout the state, the Four Corners, uh, and we use VHCB funds to allocate each year uh, to create housing and to conserve land with the goals of improving the lives of Vermonters and strengthening our communities and natural resources that support them. Protecting the permanent affordability of housing and land together is what makes VHCB unique. The coalition is asking the General Assembly to support full statutory funding for VHCB, which is 27.8 million in FY24, not just to address today's urgent needs, but for the sustainability of this essential entity and its focus on permanent affordability. Today, I am joined by five other Vermonters who have been touched by the work of VHCB and have their own life experiences as farmers, as leaders, uh, as members of their communities to share with you. With that, I'm going to go ahead and step aside and introduce the witnesses so they can tell you why they are here and what VHCB means to them. First up will be Pat Maynard with Heinsberg Town Forest. Uh, then John Benhammer will join us from the Nature Conservancy. Feels a little bit like collusion for him to be here with me. Uh, Linda Martin with the Town of Wolcott. Kate Weiner, the Trust for Public Land. And then we'll wrap with Will Duane from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thank you. I'm going to run the Zoom, so I'm going to pull your presentation up, and you just let me know when you need a slide change. Okay, okay, you can start the first slide anytime. Thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Kat Maynard. I'm currently chair of the Hinesburg Town Forest Committee. I've been on the Town Forest Committee since Moses was a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the early 80s. Um, I want to tell you how the Vermont Land Trust and the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board has enabled the town of Hinesburg to add 291 acres to our original town forest and conserve the whole 11,025 11, acres for perpetuity. I'll tell you how this came about and why it makes a difference to Hinesburg, its population, the surrounding area, the state of Vermont, and the health of the planet. And thank you for giving me this opportunity. In 2010, the select board told the town forest committee to write a new management plan for our town forest. Um, that was a two year process in our, with lots of public input. In our final draft, one of the goals was to look into conserving the HTF. What we discovered when we looked into it was that there was no way on earth we could conserve the forest with our $1,500 a year budget. <laughs> But we kept that goal in the back of our minds. Um, in the winter of 2018, we completed a forest management, also known as logging project, that enabled us to set aside $20,000 as the start of a fund to conserve the HTF. It was a nice start, but we couldn't even see the finish line. We were very uncertain whether we'd ever, ever be able to um, conserve the town forest. Then a few years later, an opportunity came along. An adjoining landowner was ready to sell. And um, some of the members of that family wanted their money sooner rather than later. Some members of the family were at least partly interested in conserving the land, others not so much. Um, VLT um, did delicate negotiations with the family and ultimately in private, you know, that was all behind the scenes and ultimately came up with a plan that would be able, hopefully, to allow Heinsberg to acquire the new land and conserve the whole thing. Um, next slide. I don't know what I don't know what you're looking at. <laughs> okay, this is our budget. Um, what I want to point out to you is how important um, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board money was to the project. VLT was able to come up 
with some money from their forest land fund to help us. We had our 20 grand and there's we go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, they, they were able to help us. Um, behind Bob Heiser was an incredible help because he had the expertise that knew, he knew what had to be done and how to do it and very carefully guided us along the way with what we had to do. We never could have done it without him. I had no idea what a complicated and detailed process conservation is. I mean, BLT has literally walked every square foot of the <laughs> land. Um, Karen Freeman of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board braved black flies to come to a site visit on the land. Um, she um, said the uh, project was self-explanatory and um, in June, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board approved their contribution and soon after BLT did. Um, we had our 20 grand that we had set aside long before, so we were able to fundraise. Um, the site is really important, be partly because of its location. It's on the eastern edge of Hinesburg uh, and it's south on the eastern edge and a little bit of Starksboro is the Fred Johnson Wildlife Management Area. Then this project connects that and ultimately Sleepy Hollow ski and bike area north of us isn't conserved, but is in fact a good area for wildlife and makes a wildlife corridor. So it's an important connection in kind of the area between the Champlain Valley and the Green Mountains, the foothills of the Green Mountains, which made it kind of special. Everybody likes clean water. I guess this morning you spent some time listening to people talk about the lake. Well, this project protects 3.5 miles of upland streams that ultimately flow into Lake Champlain. Next slide. Uh, the project provides connected land, just not for wildlife and water quality, but also for recreation. There are about 15 miles of trails in the town forest right now, including a bass trail and those, those trails connect to at least 10 miles of trails in the area. Um, the project provides land for productive and sustainable forest management, um, providing forest products. Our town hall, main hall floor came from our town forest, a bit of income, and the ability to improve the resiliency of the forest with good forest management. So that's important. Um, this land has been the location for numerous collaborations with local schools and colleges, so it's an important educational place. And our county forester, Ethan Pepper, regularly conducts uh, educational walks there. Uh, there are vernal pools on the property and some patches of dry oak forest, um, which is uncommon in Vermont. Next slide. <laughs> And then the next slide, uh, the forest stores carbon and certainly contributes to the physical and mental health of all who use it. Um, and quite a few people use it. Fundraising was a lot of work and went well. Uh, people were really generous in giving because the project matched their goals for um, the forest, all it provides and what they want for the future. In February, 22, all the documents were signed and the community celebrated. Next slide. Although urbanization and suburbanization are roaring along in Chittenden County, generations will now have the opportunity to enjoy and benefit from undeveloped land and its resources. This would not have happened, I'm sure it wouldn't have happened without BHCB and BLT working together, providing leadership and funding. Please support both these organizations so they can continue their important work. Please fully fund the HCB at its full statute. I'm like Heather now, full <laughs> statutory share of roughly 27.8 million in fiscal year 24. Current and future generations, thank you as I do today. What questions do you have? <laughs> do members have questions? Just a quick one. Sure. Representative Morris. How long did this process take from the concept to delivery? I could check with Bob. I would say about two years. Oh, you know, okay. originally I heard rumors that this family was interested in selling. And then I heard, well, BLT is talking <laughs> to them. Well, maybe it won't fly. So, you know, I don't know exactly when it started, but probably sometime in 2020. Is that fair to say, Bob? 
Okay, thank you. Representative Tori. Um, thank you very much for sharing your story. It's inspirational. Um, I was wondering about the family with the, the contiguous landowner. You mentioned that some of the family members had a need for you know access to the value. Was how did how did that need get met? Okay, I'm not privy to all the details of the negotiations, but ultimately, one family member uh, bought out the other family and conserved part of what he bought. Yeah, because it seems like. Yeah, I know it was tricky. Those I, windows could be yeah. tight. Yeah. Okay. And I wasn't privy to the delicate negotiations, but um, it happened <laughs> and everybody was happy. <laughs> yeah. Representative Simmons. Thanks, Madam Chair. Not a question, just a thank you. Um, you know, it, uh, it takes a lot of time to volunteer and make a difference, and I appreciate you doing that for Heinsberg. Well, we were so lucky to have BLT and CHCB on our side. Heinsberg's are really lucky town. We have two town bars. <laughs> Both are very different. Thank you so much for sharing that and um, yeah, for your work. It's, it is inspirational, so thank you. Um, I do have handouts. I think you all received it electronically, but if anybody is more comfortable with paper handouts, I'll leave them here for you. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening and for your work. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Binhauer. I'm uh, the protection director for the Nature Conservancy. And um, I'm pleased to be here with you today sharing uh, this uh, really um, jewel in the crown project that I've been so proud to be a part of with Nature Conservancy. Uh, I'm a constituent of uh, represent Representative Sadkowitz. And uh, um, and I have been with the Nature Conservancy for quite a long time, and I've done quite a bit of work uh, with VHCB. And so I wanted to bring this to you today. Um, the uh, Alberg Dunes uh, State Park uh, was established in 1996 um, by the Nature Conservancy and the state of Vermont. And we uh, had the, the fortune of being able to uh, have an addition to Albert Dune State Park um, in the last couple of years. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, so the all, we're, we're calling uh, the addition Albert Bluffs, and it's uh, almost a mile of frontage on Lake Champlain uh, with half wetland and half upland uh, and views of the Green Mountains and the Adirondacks. Next slide, please. And this map on the on the right here shows you uh, where the property lies in relation to Alberg Dunes State Park. And a lot of people don't even know that there are dunes in Vermont, but there are dunes <laughs> uh, on Lake Champlain. It's one of our uh, little claims to fame up there in, in Grand Isle County. Um, and uh, it's just a spectacular state park that is um, used by residents of that area and all over the state. Um, it's the largest uh, sand beach in the state. And this, uh, this partial parcel, this addition uh, adds to the splendor of the place, um, as, you can, as you can see with uh, some of the photos I'm gonna show you. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so this is, um, a, a uh, picture of, of the wetlands. Uh, some of the wetlands on the property, some of them are swamps, some are, are marshes. Uh, we, we got funding from the Waterfowl Stamp Committee as part of this project. Next slide, please. Um, this is what would have happened to the property had we not stepped in. So this was the uh, subdivision plan that was filed uh, quite a long time ago, spaghetti lots, uh, 16 lots uh, that we eventually purchased. Um, purchased all 16 of those lots. Um, and the cost was $1.1 million, which um, actually, uh, you know, we acquired the property just a couple of years ago. And I'm imagining that would have uh, at least been half again as expensive uh, now as it was then. So how big is each of those spaghetti lots about? They're each 10 acres. 
Yeah. So that was that was done a, a while ago. That was done a while ago by the by the landowner. And, there, and, and it was in an estate for 20 years. And finally, the probate judge said, I'm tired of this being in the estate. You need to have a new uh, state administrator mm. and you have six months to sell the property. So we scrambled to get an appraisal, to do all of our due diligence, to be able to um, to make this deal work. It's more like elbow macaroni. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yeah. Oh, before you go, before you go from that, oh, yeah. Just for the committee, just to, this was the classic spaghetti lot. This mm -hmm. is this relates yes. to the um, ten acre loophole. Ten, ten, well, the ten acre loophole and that used that was finally closed, but also the five, the, five, the uh, okay. ten lots within five years, within five miles of 10 acres or more. So all the lots were 10.1 acres in order to get around that requirement. Oh, this is the classic spaghetti lot yep. that we used to get from the old before. They were all over the place. Right? Yeah. Before, yeah. Old, uh, yep. before we closed so the I was going to ask. And that yeah. it was yeah. 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 And it's really, it relates to that section in statute. And it was a way to get around. So anyway. Yep. So Thank you. Important to remember. Yep. Yes. Next slide, please. So these are just pretty, some pretty pictures of the place and I encourage you to go up there. Next slide, please. A little bit of beach on this property as well. Next slide, please. That? In a delay. Yeah, there's, there's the beach, a little piece of beach. There's a, a number of different rare plants here. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, Quite a bit of frontage, as I said, on Lake Champlain. Next slide, please. And um, so what what really amazed us when, uh, when we did uh, an ecological inventory of the property, we found the 16 natural communities and all these rare species. Um, we had no idea that there was that kind of diversity on the property. Next slide, please. So here was, a, a very rough budget for your, um, I mean, it was much longer, much longer budget, but, but this was, this shows uh, what VHCB investment did for this property. I mean, this is really a jewel in the crown for the state of Vermont um, and will be a spectacular resource for the state of Vermont forever. And VHCB investment of just under half a million dollars leveraged this very large grant from the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is a federal fund. Um, and we were able to make this deal happen with, with those monies. And then also we did quite a bit of fundraising uh, as well. And with that, if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, actually, I don't know if you know this, but um, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, are we fully accessing our share of that? And, and do we do it mostly through BHCB matches or? Yeah, so um, I don't have a full understanding of LWCF, but um, LWCF stateside is there's a fund for state land projects uh, and they have to be matched uh, at 50% uh by with state funds and so that's what makes it really critical to have vhcb funding because if you can't come up with that match either through fundraising or through uh, you know some other source um, it's very difficult to get these projects to work <clears throat> lwcf funds national parks and you know those kinds of acquisitions as well and those are at a different those are at 90 or 100 percent yeah i'll just add that congress just fully funded lwcf like a year or two ago so it was, there's some similarities there with hcb and the states state yeah correct yeah. yeah great well thanks for sharing that project now we're all going to have to go visit and um absolutely very cool thank you great place uh, Representative Morrison. Just oh, clarification, LWCF, is that a federal program? Yes, yes. It's Land and Water Conservation Fund. It, it's funded by um, offshore oil le uh, lease revenues. We might need to change um, that. And um, yeah, so, and, and those are and the, continuing revenues over time. Um, thank you. Yep. Oh my God. <laughs> my people are full. <laughs>
money is made from the offshore lease? It's it's revenues from those leases. So the companies pay into a fund, um, the lease fund, and those lease monies go toward um, this land and water conservation fund. It was a way to kind of make um, make it palatable to have offshore leases and have the money going towards something that's you know permanent conservation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Martin. I'm a former state representative for 12 years, and I've also served in Wilkett Town Government for 37 years as town clerk and treasurer, and now I am chair of the Wilkett Select Board. And thank you for allowing me to this opportunity to speak about what a profound opportunity having our own town forest will be for our community. My agenda for why I wanted to serve on the select board was to bring a sense of community to our town that was lacking. And the idea of having a community forest has achieved that in so many ways. I come here today to bring the human side to what state funding to the Vermont Housing Conservation Board does for people of Vermont. Our town plan calls for the creation of a town forest because our planners have seen how important a town forest has been to quality and life in Vermont and across the state. During COVID, the Wilkett Elementary School started holding outdoor classrooms. They reached out to the select board to see if we would support obtaining land near the school for a town forest. They wanted to expand their outdoor education program and use the forest as an outdoor classroom year round where kids could develop an interest in science and math through nature and also set up a pattern for an active and healthy lifestyle. Research has shown that school performance increases when children learn outdoors, and that increases students' physical, mental, and social health, and supports emotional behavior and intellectual development. For over a year and a half, we have been working with the Trust for Public Land to purchase two properties totaling 735 acres in the center of our community, adjacent to the elementary school and the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. <clears throat> when we held our town vote to purchase the land, more people came out in support of the idea than we see at town meeting. A recent grant from Vorek is helping to create a professionally built network within the future community forest, creating an exciting recreational asset that will be complementing the multi the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail and proposed Velmont Trail. The grant will establish a new five mile multi-use trail network providing multi-generational accessible outdoor opportunities for all ages and abilities while protecting the natural resources found on the property. It will also be used to create a trail from the school providing <clears throat> safe passage between the Wolcott Recreation Field and the rail trail. This will allow a safe passage for students to reach after school sports events, the library or rail trail and removing the need to travel by car. As I mentioned, this land is close to the center of our community. It is our hope that it will be a boom to the quality of life in Wolcott and help attract new citizens and businesses. It will also contribute to the health of our citizens by providing close to home destination outdoor recreation. Having protected areas within walking or biking distance reduces car travel, air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and accidents that are a byproduct of driving. The project protects 29 acres of significant wetlands, 4.7 miles of headwater streams, and direct frontage on the Elmore Branch and the Lamoille River, providing long-term protection to the river corridor 
and encouraging the reestablishment <clears throat> of floodplain vegetation will help prevent future infrastructure damage and allow the river to flood and move as it was designated to do, designed to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. This will increase flood resiliency in the village, provide important aquatic habitat, and support water quality in the Lamoille River. The property also contains a portion of a groundwater source protection area near the elementary school and nearly 11 acres of the 100 year flood plain associated with the Elmore Branch and Lamoille River. The Wilka Community Forest Project will also limit future forest fragmentation, which is an extreme stressor in the Lamoille River watershed given the high development pressure. The property provides a rich and diverse habitat for a multitude of species, and the proposed project will benefit many of the state wildlife action plans, wide-ranging and forest-dwelling species of greatest conservation need, such as moose, uh, otter, and bobcat. The property acts as a stepping stone for wildlife between the core forests of Elmore State Park, C.C. Putnam State Forest and the East Hill Wildlife Management Area. The primary threats to the viability of these species are habitat losses through fragmentation, degradation, and conversion. With elevations ranging from 670 feet along the Lamoille River to 1,225 feet, the property allows species to move up the elevational gradient as the climate changes. In a state with a significant amount of our protected land at high elevations, conservation of these lower elevation forests are a priority. Wolcott is also in the middle of trying to create a community wastewater system which in the past has limited growth in our village center. After analysis of a suitable area, it was determined that some of the school property would be the best place for a wastewater dispersal field, but would require a force main through the adjoining property. Luckily, the adjoining property is part of what will become the community forest. So the forest can also help make possible new wastewater capability capacity, which will spur needed economic development and additional housing in our village center. We're also thrilled that this project is what VHCB considers a dual goal project. Not only will it conserve more than 700 acres of important forest land, but Trust for Public Land is also working with the Lamoille County Habitat for Humanity to create affordable housing less than a quarter of a mile from the elementary school in the center of town. Not only will this provide two families with an affordable place to live near a school and adjacent to a community forest and all its amenities, but also give high school students at Green Mountain Technology and Career Center real work skills and hands-on experience in house construction, setting them up for a good paying job that is in high demand. <laughs> Funds from VHCB are an essential part of the other state and private funds raised for this project, totaling over $1.6 million. <clears throat> VHCB's investment of 563,000 <clears throat> leveraged three to one by other funding will result in new recreation opportunities, improved community health, and enrich the quality of life in our community. So today I'm asking to please fund VHCB at its full statutory share of $2.8 million so other communities have the opportunity to improve their quality of life too. Thank you. Thank you. That's a lot. Great story. <laughs> There's so many aspects of it that are come into play. Any questions for Linda, Representative Sebelia? Just a clarification. I'm not sure that I've heard the number correctly. I heard 
how I learned that. Okay. Um, I heard you uh, just talk about the full statutory amount being 2.8 million, and I thought I had heard I thought I had heard a much larger number. <clears throat> you heard what? I thought I had heard yeah, 28. 27.8. Yeah. Oh, it's 27. Yeah. Okay. Did I say it wrong. That's all right. I just wanted to make sure that we know the amount. So, okay. Yes, 27. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kate Wanner, Senior Project Manager with the Trust for Public Lands, working with communities like Wilkett to create the town forest um, that uh, you just heard about, and as well working uh, with the state um, that you'll hear about in a second um, at Otter Creek Wildlife Management Area. Um, so I've uh, been working in the last 18 years with Trust for Public Land to help conserve forests all around Vermont. Um, you may have heard of some of our work, uh, Jim Jefferson State Forest in Rutland County, <laughs> North Branch Park um, right here in Montpelier, Catamount Community Forest in Williston. Um, but you may not uh, be aware of Trust for Public Land's work on a national level around conservation economics. Um, as we discuss the value of full VHEP funding, as well as you bring H126 forward, um, I, I thought it would be helpful for you to hear a little about some research we did a few years ago with the Vermont Forest Partnership on the return on investment of VHEP funding. Uh, so the Trust Public Lands Conservation Economics Team helps uh, the public, government agencies, and elected officials understand the measurable economic impact of conservation. Over the past 15 years, we have helped 16 different states look at the return on investment of their direct state dollars that was invested in conservation. Um, across those 16 states, we have found that each dollar of state investment in land conservation has returned between four to $11 in natural goods and services. So in order to calculate the return on states investments in land conservation, we first had to define what we meant by state investment and then identify where those investments were made. For the purposes of this study, um, we looked at VHGB funding, the River Corridor Easement Program, the Duck Stamp Fund, <coughs> and Long Trails Fund. Um, the vast majority of that was VHGB funding. Um, so we did this study in 2018. So we looked at the data from um, 1988 when VHGB started through 2016. And during that time, 315,000 acres were permanently conserved using $95.4 million of state fees. <coughs> um, so this was leveraged um, significantly by other federal, private, um, and other state funds, um, but at, it was an average cost of $303 per acre um, of VHV or duck stamp or long trail funds. Um, so that was, that was the investment. And then to get at the return, Oh, do you have the charts? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, to get at the return, we needed to understand the land cover types of each acre that that funding um, conserved. So various land cover types, such as forests, wetlands, or pasture, provide different um, values of natural goods and services. So once we understood exactly which acres have been protected by those state dollars and what type of land cover that were conserved, we then turned to the scientific literature and academics uh, to understand the um, natural benefits that these lands provide and what their value was. So we were trying to look at the annual value of each acre of forest land, pasture land, wetland, et cetera. So as an example, for deciduous forest, the natural goods and services that we included were air pollution removal, carbon sequestration, carbon storage, and erosion control or water quality. So for an average, and this is in 2018 dollars, so um, it would be much higher now. Um, so um, in an acre of deciduous forest, those natural goods and services provide $180 every year um, per acre. Um, and then, do you have the, the blue chart with the, oh, the other one? The other blue chart? <laughs> it's a delay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so the di the different types of land cover. So wetlands um, would provide a very different like flood resiliency, and and that actually ended up being like five hundred and forty dollars per acre wetlands. So forests also provide other natural goods and services such as wildlife habitat related benefits, um, but the per acre value of this benefit has not yet been measured 
in the literature and thus we were unable to include it in the analysis. So that's an example of how this re um, return on investment is, is very conservative. So the state had invested 95.4 million in land conservation. After adjusting for inflation over that time, that means the state invested about 227 million in 2018 dollars. We know that this investment uh, protected 350,000 acres. And by looking at um, the value of the uh, ecological services that each of those acres provided, um, we found that that was providing $2.23 billion in economic value in the forms of natural goods and services. So that ended up being on a ratio of nine to one. So for every dollar that VA should be spent, you got $9 of ecological services in return over time. Although I, I'm gonna just interrupt you for a second. Sure. I'm finding myself a little distracted looking for this table under your name. Do we have this one, Lauren? Or did you look somewhere else for it? Because there's, there's a category that says tables. It's I know. Last, it's the last one in the tables. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't go far enough. What are you looking for? It's it's this table. Yes. In on our page, but I think I, I think Representative Stebbins just found it for me. And the full the full report should be in there too. Um, which I just want to draw the atten members' attention to that. Well, you brought us a lot of great information. Yes, sure. And sure. and and you know we have not updated it to 2023, um, but the the general gist of it is still very relevant for all the past VHUB investments that have made in the past and that the ecological services that they are still providing um, and will provide forever for uh, Vermonters. So this is looks at the different types of land cover type and how many um, dollars per acre of ecological services they are providing to all of us. Um, so the nine to one ratio is for ecological services only. Um, so as you all know, in addition to providing natural goods and services, Land conservation also supports several important economic sectors in Vermont and jobs across the state, um, such as our working landscape, tourism, and outdoor recreation um, industries, which is um, more than $1.5 billion annually. Unfortunately, the information um, necessary to isolate the direct contribution of conservation land to forestry, ag, and outdoor rec was not available across Vermont, so we couldn't incorporate it into ROI. Um, there are some isolated studies. So, for example, you know, the benefits the Kingdom Trails bring to East Burke. Um, they did an analysis um, here where I, I live in Warren um, of the Blueberry Lake Trails at $1.5 million to the valley um, from the, the folks that come um, to the Blueberry Lake Trails. But we weren't able to kind of extrapolate that across every type of conservation. So we weren't able to include that. Um, as um, Linda mentioned, and as you know, access to conserved land and parks and trails can also help a community meet health goals and reduce medical costs. Um, increased access to outdoor spaces encourages people to exercise more and reduces healthcare costs related to BCEV and associated chronic diseases such as diabetes. Increased exposure to the outdoors can also lead to long-term mental health improvements. And new research is finding that conservation that can decrease the risk of tick-borne illnesses such as Lyme disease. So again, I want to emphasize that all of those health benefits are not included in this ROI. So the ROI of nine to one is just for ecological services, and it would be much, much more if we were able to calculate all these additional um, benefits. All to say, I hope you uh, support full statutory funding um, for VHB at 27.8 million. Um, which based on our analysis will um, return over time $250 million of ecosystem services. That's another number that we might just have you say one more time yeah. slowly. <laughs> so I hope you support full statutory funding of $27.8 million, which at a minimum will return $250 million of ecosystem services for the conservation lands purchased with those things. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> and I'm happy to also answer any questions about Wilkit or about Otter Creek um, that will make great if you need help. <laughs> great. And I just also want to draw members' attention. Um, Kate mentioned this at the beginning that, you know, this is related to our conversations we've been having on H126. And we talked about having her in on that, She's given us all of that background information now. And I'm going to 
put you on the spot a little, but if no questions related to that, this is a great chance to ask them. And you've got lots to read over the weekend because <laughs> it's all here now. Thank you for your testimony. I'll oh, ask a question. Okay, Representative Morris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Kate, for coming in. My, my question is, um, is the land, we've seen several different properties today or regions that were covered. Are that, is that considered permanently conserved? Ones in our study? Yes, these are all permanent conservation through either easements or direct fee land acquisition um, that use state funds. So development is not possible? Correct. Okay, thank you. Representative Smith and Tory. Shoreline, uh, if it's preserved, are boaters allowed to pull their boats up to the beach and, and picnic there and uh, do things like that? I th um, yeah, I think it all depends on the um, <coughs> different regulations through DC. I know that there's different rules for different size lakes and different shorelines. So I'm not an expert in that, I'm afraid. I don't know how much you know about shorelines. All right. Sorry. That's okay. Representative Tory, I just was wondering about the um, how does that um, amount compare to the other funding for VHC for um, housing? So the amount that has been proposed for housing, um, well, the, we're asking for the full statutory share of for VA should be and not kind of the extra bonus funding okay. for housing. So, the, but the 27 million is both housing and conservation. Both housing That's and conservation, yes, yes. Okay. As the, the normal statutory funding that is tied to the transfer tax. And one point I wanna make about the transfer tax is that, I, I mean, I think it was beautifully designed to fund VHGB this way because in the years, such as we've had the last three years, where you have increased housing costs, increased demand for land, um, a lot of people moving here, a lot of people buying both houses and land. The cost for us to conserve the land and the cost for the folks to build housing has gone up significantly. So when you have more transfer tax coming in because of the churn and the demand, then we also need that um, raise in funding around conservation and housing to be able to compete with the rise in demand. Thank you for your testimony. Sure. I'll have some, oh, perfect, here we are. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. Uh, for the record, my name is Will Duane. I'm the Land Acquisition Coordinator at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Just work up the hill at our National Life Office. I'm here today to highlight the impact that VHCB funding has on my department's ability to conserve and permanently <coughs> protect land. I know you've been hearing a lot from my colleagues lately um, about the conservation work we do at Fish and Wildlife and ANR, but I often find that a lot of Vermonters are not as familiar with the Department of Fish and Wildlife's public land holdings as they are with, say, the state parks or the state forests. So uh, here in Vermont, the Department of Fish and Wildlife owns a tremendous amount of public land. We have over 100 unique wildlife management areas and riparian stream bank parcels across the state. Our, our last check on the acreage was just over 135,000 acres. Uh, we're also the largest single owner of wetlands uh, in the state of Vermont. Um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife has several funding streams that we use to acquire property. Um, we have state funding, we have federal funding, and currently we have access to a tremendous amount of federal funding. And in order for us to draw that money down, as you folks probably know, we need non-federal dollars to, to leverage it and, and bring it into our coffers for projects. Uh, VHCB is critical to that work. We have monies available from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service through the Pittman-Robertson Act. Uh, in order to bring those monies to us to put on the ground, we have to provide uh, a cost share ratio. It's, it's one to three, so the classic 25%, 75% federal <coughs> uh, combination. Uh, and without having a, a separate 
unique dedicated state funding source to draw those monies down, it can be complicated to put funding packages together to act on that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we have our duck stamp fund, we have our habitat stamp fund, and we have a little bit of clean water fund money for, for state dollars, but VHCB plays a huge role in bringing us state money to, to draw down those federal ones. Um, and that's why we're here today to ask that we please fund VHCB to their full statutory authority. Uh, the project I'd like to focus on today uh, is all about biodiversity and connectivity. Uh, I also think it shows a great example of not just the habitat connectivity, but the connection between all the partner organizations that have come together on this acquisition, this conservation project. Um, and it's pretty typical. On this project, we've got the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, we've got the Trust for Public Land, uh, we've got VHCB, uh, the Vermont Rivers Conservancy is gonna co-hold an easement with VHCB. We've got funding from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and we've also brought in our sister department of forest parks and rec uh, to add this to their forest legacy program. So we're, we're bringing all the cooks into the kitchen and we're really maxing out the benefits on this project, but it takes time and uh, it takes money to get these, these done. Uh, so what we're looking at right now is a planned expansion of our Otter Creek wildlife management area. This is in the town of Wallingford. Um, our existing footprint for Otter Creek WMA is just to the south. It's about seven miles here down to the border of Mount Tabor and Danby. So what you see in orange is a new addition to the WMA and it's a large tract of land and sometimes you'll see this. It's the same unit, um, but they're not necessarily abutting. Um, can you tell us what that means to be the same unit then? Yeah, it will be managed by the same staff and it will be covered by the same long range management plan. Um, it's not so far apart that we feel that these are so unique that they need different names, different staff and different management plans. They're all along the Otter Creek as, as the name suggests. Um, so we're about three miles upstream from Wallingford Village. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, Lauren, thanks. We're just, it's all maps. We're just getting closer and closer. Um, and uh, as many, Folks know from Hurricane Irene, Wallingford uh, was in the same boat. They experienced pretty devastating flooding and erosion um, and a prolonged recovery effort that took years. Uh, the Wallingford Village Historic District is in the Otter Creek Corridor and um, they currently have about 176 buildings on the National Register of Historic Places. So conserving this floodplain and these wetlands are, are pretty crit critical, not just for habitat and biodiversity, but the human <clears throat> impact and the co-benefits that come with it. So um, the property is 344 acres. It's got about 100 acres of floodplain, 107 acres of wetland. Um, it's got almost, well, actually more than a mile of frontage on Otter Creek itself. Um, it's mostly forested, uh, forested. There is some ag land there that um, it's not quite fallow, but it's not super productive ag land. It's right in the floodplain and it floods annually. Uh, and there is just a ton of biodiversity packed in to this parcel. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, on these 344 acres, there are um, eight state historic or state significant natural communities, uh, 16 rare plant species, and we have a, an instance of verified occurrence of the globally vulnerable uh, wood turtle, which folks don't see too often here in Vermont. So we're very excited about this project. And so we brought all the partners together on this. And again, the connectivity and the biodiversity is within the project itself. Um, that first map, we're basically making a whole connection out of the Taconic Mountains onto the Otter Creek floodplain, the Vermont Valley floor, and then all the way up to basically the Appalachian Trail and the Green Mountain. National Forest. And what you've seen to the east here, what's in red on this map is another project that Kate and the folks at Trust for Public Land are working on to make an addition to the Green Mountain National Forest. This is the, the White Rocks Gateway Edition, which will be able to share infrastructure uh, like parking lots for these two projects, which um, you can get in the weeds and spend a lot of time thinking about those parking lots on these small projects. So, uh, and just uh, typically what we do, this will be managed as a wildlife management area. So it's gonna be managed for um, basically 1A wildlife habitat and 1B public access. We open these lands up for hunting, trapping, angling, uh, dispersed, non-motorized, non-mechanized wildlife based recreation. You can be just wanting to go out and see some animals. You can go out for birding. Uh, these properties are open for snowshoeing and cross country skiing. 
So uh, this is just one example of the work we do. I'd say this is a, a prime example of about a dozen projects we try and get through a year. Uh, as Ms. Washburn said when she was in last week, we're a small dedicated team. We're, we're relentless and we're nimble um, and, and <coughs> we go after every, every lead we get. So again, I just wanna say that um, the funding that VHCB makes available uh, and we apply just like any other applicant for their grants um, makes it possible for us to do these works. So that you please fund VHCB to the full statutory level of 27.8 million. That was great. Uh, can you tell us how this property came to your attention? And how yeah, I've, I've been in my role um, coming up almost on two years. And right when I got started, Kate was right there with the Colonel, actually much more than the Colonel of this project and uh, TPL kind of took the lead on it. But that's an example of how things come to us. We get private individuals reaching out to us, landowners, um, partner organizations who are either going to work with us or say this isn't a great fit for us. What do you guys think? So we get information on new projects in a ton of different ways. So just to expand on that, we had been working in Wallaford on the addition to um, Beaumont Ash Forest, and a neighbor said, well, I'm interested in adding my land to the National Forest too, but I'm on the other side of Hartsboro Road, and that was actually outside the Green Mountain Forest acquisition boundary. So you can move that boundary with an act of Congress, um, but- This was easy. <laughs> this was a little <laughs> easier, particularly with um, all of the wetlands and Otter Creek front end, yeah. we immediately connected with the Fish and Wildlife, and they said, yes, we want this. And so we put the deal together and have been working with them. And, and originally it was just um, about, 200 acres, and we connected with um, an adjoining landowner who had more frontage on the Otter Creek, and they said yes um, also, and we connected with another landowner to the north to get more wetlands and more Otter Creek frontage, but that one, that landowner wasn't quite ready yet. Yeah. Um, so anytime kind of we see an opportunity to make uh, an acquisition bigger through adjoining landowners, we try to make that happen. Particularly because if you're spending a lot of time um, you know, adding on to core forest, it, 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 it's great to kind of continue to um, have that landscape connectivity and wildlife connectivity. Great, thanks. Uh, Representative Smith. Thank you. <clears throat> the previous uh, chart you had up there, you go back to that. Go back one, maybe to the larger. Can you tell me, yeah, up in the uh, left hand corner, there are two close, tight yellow property lines. Yes, sir. There are two parcels there. Uh, it's one parcel. Uh, this is a uh, railroad and VTrans owned corridor right here. So one property owner owns about to here, and this is a balance of his property that we'll be acquiring. He has got a barn here and carved out a little. So uh, all there is, there's a railroad track between the two. Yeah, uh, Route 7, the railroad, the creek, and then the mountains. Okay, thank you. Brings up an interesting question. How will the public access this property? On Hartsboro Road, um, where the two properties are kind of kitty corner, caddy corner to one another, we'll have a parking lot, which will likely be on the White Rocks portion. There are a few pull-offs on Hartsboro Road as well. And then as part of our interim management plan, but more likely in the long range management plan, uh, we've identified a few parts where uh, parking lots might be good. We'll make a curb cut and go through the whole V-Trans process. Um, Representative Seven, <clears throat> you your hand up. I did, but I'll pass. Representative Sevilla. So I actually have a question related to the, the statutory amount, um, which uh, I'm hearing, and the actually the previous um, testimony, 27.8 uh, or 28.7? 27.8. 27.8. Okay. And nine times return and conservation. Here's my question. 27.8 for VHCB, 100% of that goes towards conservation? I believe that's housing and conservation. Oh, you're right. It's even more. <laughs> it depends on the return on housing. So it would be less. So it be less on conservation. Well, do, you know do you know what the breakdown is? Is there a breakdown or is it? 60 to, to conservation? Housing. 60 to housing. 40 40 to conservation. Okay. So yes, I apologize. Nope, but Matt there. That's okay. <laughs> sure, I was. All right. But one point it's to make: so that was, you know, over the last twenty-five years, <laughs> with um, 
you know, private and other federal match funding and really huge amount of federal funding that is available in the next five years because of the Investment Reduction Act or the Inflation Reduction Act that I think the leverage over the next couple of years is going to be much higher of what we're bringing in terms of federal funds and, and even private funds. So um, I think that, you know, if we were to look at the return investment 10 years from now, it, it could be quite significantly higher than um, nine to one because we're bringing a lot more leverage. So we Thank touched you. on this. Is there, is, can, I don't know if one of you is able to summarize <clears throat> maybe what's coming through the infrastructure or the Inflation Reduction Act and our opportunities, the, the need for state match now, is there, do you have numbers on that? So one example is the Federal Forest Legacy Program, um, which has a one-time chunk of $700 million that has never been available for it. Um, usually there's $100 million that is distributed across the country. Um, based on uh, competitive applications that, and Vermont has done very well. We've um, gotten a, a greater share than a lot of other states in federal forest like Spring, which was started by our dear Senator Leahy. Um, so that 700 million um, needs a 25% um, state or local match. Um, so in order to even be able to apply for that extra funding, you know, we need to find a private or state match of those acquisitions. And those can be used for both large forest land easements um, with the easement held by the state or town forest or um, state additions, state fee acquisitions. Um, so that is one big chunk. There is a lot more available also in regional conservation partnership, 1.5 billion um, available there. Uh, there is so, wait, say, that, say that one again. What is that one? A regional conservation partnership program, <laughs> and that's through NRC. <laughs> uh, we're actually working on um, a current uh, a conservation easement up in Victory that uses um, the regional conservation partnership program through the Healthy Forest Reserve program, which will conserve about 600 acres. So those are easements held by NRCS, um, and that's yeah a, a brand new 1.5 billion dollars in the in the IRA for that. Um, there's a lot more in the um, corporate forest. I don't know all the numbers off the top of my head. I want to pull up the spreadsheet that we've already had that. Oh yeah, right. Um, um, I'll also add that um, my department's annual federal funding stream also has money available more than typical. Um, our money from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we sometimes refer to as PR money, Pittman-Robertson Act funds. Those are, they come to us basically on an excise tax on hunting, angling, trapping equipment, outdoor equipment, and get the first to the several states from U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We typically get about $150,000 of that each year for land acquisition. Um, those monies, and the amounts have changed quite a bit during the pandemic, just based on human behavior and the purchases that people made. And uh, there is a lot of federal money for us to draw down, I think somewhere around two and a half, three million. So is one of you tracking or could one of you track and share with us the um, opportunities and then what we would need and match to- Yeah, um, fortunately the work that uh, Trey Martin at VHCB kicked off last year, one of the first things we started working on and Kate and I are in a subgroup for this along with Lauren is to track these federal things. Okay. What's it gonna take to leverage it? Where are the different corners we can work? And because of the VHCB and our effort, we have that close to ready to share. Great, looking forward to having that to share and make sure we have the information we need so that we can help with our part to make the match happen. Yeah. Have further questions for any of our guests? Yes. Just a comment. If you, anybody is ever up for a good hike, I recommend White Rocks. Yeah. I've never been there before. It's pretty impressive. And the, the one thing about, so the White Rocks cliffs are kind of currently protected by Greenmont National Forest right here. Um, and the ice bed trails is, is absolutely gorgeous. And then the Appalachian Trail right here. But this property that we're adding um, is full of old growth hemlock and-, and um, That's the site and, that we need to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Field trip to the old growth. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah, um, and the, yeah the, the current owners, you know, they haven't managed it over the last 120 years. And they were so thrilled to be able 
uh, to permanently protect it. Cool. So that so that is using land and water conservation fund dollars, um, which was mentioned earlier today. So the land and water conservation fund has, you know, both state side, which comes to the state to be able to um, use for state acquisitions like John's project, um, but also can be used um, 100 percent for national forest acquisitions. Um, and that number, because of the Great America Outdoors Act two years ago, uh, three years ago, uh, provided um, 900 million, which is the, their full statutory funding. And that's going to stay now at the full 900 million. And we hope the HGB can do that too. <laughs> we, I do too. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, Green Mountain National Forest, my understanding is would not have an easement on a property, but the landowners have been assured the trees will not be cut or? No. Um, this is in a management unit called Green Mountain Escarpment. Um, and the Green Mountain Escarpment, um, the main goals in the current Green Mountain forest, uh, forest Plan from 2006 is that those goals are for biodiversity and recreation. Um, so the likelihood of it being timbered is very low, but it is not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, further questions? Not seeing any. Thank you all for your great work and for coming in today to share it with us. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, that is um, the end of our scheduled work for today. Um, we are back together as a committee on let's say at one. Okay, so I think we're going to start using our 15 minutes, in particular on the days where um, Tuesday, when we have so much time in the morning. So to reset your clock to coming into committee at one o'clock, um, and that's next week, hold on a sec. And then the following week, the floor times are going to be bumped up to one o'clock. So we're going to go from three o'clock to four o'clock, or one o'clock floor times, but that's next week, the following week. Next week, we stick with the schedule we're on, and but, but for this committee starting at one. Um, and we'll get into the budget next week a little bit. Keep working on 126, and which is um, 30 by 30 bill, and also the bottle bill. Any final questions before we wrap for the weekend? Just one, I have. Yes. I'm going to be in Columbus, but I'm uh, I'm going to try to be on Zoom when we talk about the bottle bill because I'd like to be involved in it. Okay, great. <clears throat> I know my vote won't count, but if you can put it out an extra beyond five more days after next week, I'd like to be able to participate in a vote. Okay. If possible. If not, I understand. Yeah. And you're an hour difference in time. And you'll well, I don't figure that think out. So. Oh, it's I don't. okay. Think the same. Same. All right. Okay. Well, anyway. Representative I have a related Lopez. question. Thank you. Um, I I know that the uh, rules committee was planning to meet again to consider whether or not remote participation um, for votes was going to be possible. Um, have you heard any more information on this from leadership recently? I yeah. don't. I have not. As far as I know, it has not changed. Okay. Oh, okay. No. So. All right, with that, we will adjourn for the weekend. Thank you all for your work this week.